Hi, everyone, and welcome to AWS Nordic's Office Hours with me, Gunnar Grosch. I am a developer advocate here at Amazon Web Services. And this is your weekly show coming to you live from the Nordics, where I bring on guests to well, teach you something new, teach you about a service, teach you about a feature, show you solutions, and let you, our viewers, ask your questions. And well, hopefully, we'll be able to answer them. And if you have any questions throughout the show, just post them in the chat and we'll we'll try to get to the questions throughout the show. So don't worry if we don't answer your questions straight away. We'll get to, to them eventually. So this week, I am joined by Chris Howard. Chris is from the same team as I am, the developer relations team. And uh, well, you're coming to us from Zurich. Was that right, Chris? Yeah, I'm normally based in Munich, but uh, I'm working out of the Zurich office for the next three days. And it's my first time in Switzerland, and it's it's beautiful. So welcome to the show, Chris. This week, we're going to talk about machine learning for non-data scientists. So you're not a sci data scientist, right, Chris? No, I, I come from a web developer background uh, a long time ago. I was a front-end developer and always interested in machine learning and especially how I could apply it. But I don't know about you. I've seen a lot of talks at tech conferences over the years that say machine learning for, for software developers or web developers. And then you get there and it's just all calculus. And I haven't done calculus in a really <laughs> long time. So so I'm, I'm always on the lookout for, for examples that I can apply that don't require me to be a data scientist. Yeah. And there's an addition to the title as well, that it's for non-data scientists and... And knitters. Yeah. Yes. So. I don't know the Swedish word for knitting. I know in German it's it's stricken. Yeah. Stick sticka. Oh sticka. Oh, it's very similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I am a knitter. I, I grew up uh, I didn't grow up knitting, actually. It was something I, I lived in Australia for many years. And when I moved to Australia, I took up knitting as a hobby. Um, and so it's something I've I've just done off and on for a long time. And anytime I get the opportunity to combine knitting and technology, I I jump on it. And I think I told you this, you know, there are a lot of similarities between the two. Knitting patterns are almost like a domain specific language. Yeah. Yeah, you, you told me that. And uh, so, well, let's talk about uh, the show a bit, what we're going to try to cover. So machine learning is a very broad topic. So we're not going to talk about everything in regards to machine learning. But we're going to look at, at some areas within machine learning. So can you tell me a, a bit about what we're going to cover? Sure. I mean, I, I don't know about you, Gunnar, but I find when I want to learn a new technology, getting hands-on is best. But I, I a lot of times the intro tutorials are like, build a to-do list. And that's not interesting to me. I like to try and solve a real problem, even if it might be a slightly silly problem. So my my angle on this was, as a knitter, you know, I see people on the bus and I, I as you held up a beautiful jumper to me just a few moments ago. And I'm always like cataloging the patterns. Oh, I can steal that. I can use that. I can work that in. And I, in my brain, can work out what the pattern is. And it occurred to me that I wonder if computer vision could do it, if I as a knitter could do it. So I, I over the last few years, have been working sort of on this little hobby project to try and teach a computer vision model to recognize different knitting stitches. And it's not as silly as it sounds. There are actually some research researchers at, at universities like MIT who are also trying to solve this problem. But I came at it, you know, from a very simple non-data scientist part of it. And so I thought I'd show you my little project today. I've, I've used a few different AWS services as well. I started two years ago when I started this project with SageMaker, um, Amazon SageMaker. But uh, since then, we have released recognition custom labels, which actually makes it a lot simpler. And so I can show you a bit about what I've learned about comparing the two. Very cool. All right, so uh, let's talk about the inspiration to this. Then uh, you you talked about knitting and you talked about a bit about patterns. So let's go back. I think let's go <laughs> way way back to to knitting from the beginning. Well, I mean, what like ancient Egypt? You thinking yeah. like you know like I'm centuries thinking and centuries ancient... ago? Yes. <laughs> 
I've done a little bit of research on knitting because knitting patterns, as I said, like a domain specific language is an interesting thing. You know, for a long time, knitting patterns were not written down. They were just passed down. In I mean, obviously the Nordics have a wonderful long tradition of, of knitting. And I've looked into some of the, the Norwegian and the Swedish patterns. They're just beautiful. Um, but they would be taught in families and not written down until really only in the last sort of 200 years where they actually sort of formalized. And the interesting thing is there's no standard for writing them. Everybody writes them differently. They use different abbreviations. Some people use symbols, use letters. And, and it's, um, you know, I've seen examples where you can't just give a, a knitting pattern to another knitter and expect them to execute. It's like assembly code. You know, you have to know what the actual terms mean in this, in this particular language or framework. Um, and so that, that's one area of overlap that I got really interested in. And I, I sort of developed a tech talk that I delivered to both computer science people, but also to knitters about the similarities between knitting and, and computer programs. Because, you know, when you are, ex when you are knitting from a pattern, you were almost like a computer executing the pattern, you know, it have, we have for loops and while loops and switch statements. Um, they're just about knitting instead of about computer, uh, computer execution. So, uh, let me just interrupt you there for a quick, uh, intro to the people who just joined us. There was an issue, uh, starting out. So we weren't broadcasting to the AWS Twitch channel, but oh. we are now. So, ah. Hi, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for joining us at the AWS Nordics office hours. I'm joined by Chris Howard today, and we're talking about machine learning for non-data scientists and knitters. And knitters. So, so that's why we were talking about knitting just Oh, now. they would have been so, very confused. <laughs> very confused. Uh, so <laughs> back to the knitting then and, and the patterns. Yes. So, well, how... How can we apply machine learning to this? Well, there are a few different ways you could do it. I mean, knitting at, at its at its basis, there are really only two knitting stitches, knit and purl. So knitting is inherently binary. You can encode data in knitting. There are so many, you know, different uh, analogies between knitting and, and computers. Um, and and dep depending on how you combine those knits and purls, you make different stitch patterns, as we call it, different textures. And so I wanted to see if I could if I could read that, if I could do it the way I do in my head. And um, there's this whole discipline called forensic knitting, where knitters are actually trying to reverse, this is reverse engineering, reverse engineer patterns from photographs. There's a very famous example, if any knitters are listening, the Queen Susan shawl, which was a photo of a shawl from the Shetland Islands um, that a group of 30 knitters worked on online to reverse engineer just from the photograph, you know? So it's looking at it, it's trying to, trying different experiments to see if you can duplicate the stitch. And now that they've actually recreated the shawl, they've re-released it under a Creative Commons license. So I think that is a very cool example. Uh, and so for my project, I sort of, my original thought was, it's almost like reading handwriting, you know, like cursive handwriting. So I thought maybe it's an OCR problem, an optical character recognition problem, like a scanner, you know? And so yeah. I, I thought of trying to, trying to approach it that way. Um, and luckily we work with some very smart people at AWS. And so I chatted with a machine learning expert and she said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Go with, go with, just make it, just make it, um, uh, just go with making it a classific image classification problem, which simplifies the space quite a lot. Right. Yeah. And uh, to do that, there are a few different ways of how to do that, to recognize patterns or, or objects in images. Uh, yes. Um, well, you took, I think you took one approach first. So should I think we start I took the there? hard approach first. Yeah, so let's start there. And yeah. once again, you're not a data scientist. No, let's I'm not. Establish that, so. I only learned as much as I needed to do this project. Um, and so what I did is I found uh, that um, uh, there's a, an existing project that some researchers are doing at MIT. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you have, you have the link there, I think, Gunnar, but yep. um, Neural Inverse Knitting is a project. He's very smart computer scientists are doing where they're trying to uh, print out a swatch. And you're going to hear me use that word a lot. A swatch is just a little sample of knitting, uh, you know, knit one, feed it into this model. That's the neural inverse knitting there. Feed it into a model, have it work out the pattern, then feed that into a knitting machine and ideally spit out an identical swatch. Uh, and they've gotten to about 80% accuracy um, using very big data sets. They're using simulated and real knitting as training. 
I, I didn't have any of that capability. So I decided to start very simple um, and use uh, Amazon SageMaker uh, to try and train a model that could just identify between a very few basic stitches. And I also had the crazy idea to source my own data set. Um, because there are, there are open data sets out there. Uh, the, the MIT people have actually made their data set available, but knitting has some problems when it comes to computer vision. You know, knitting is stretchy. It's floppy. Mm. It's fuzzy, depending on the yarn. So I thought, oh, I know. I'll just crowdsource my data set. So that, that so was the first challenge. <laughs> this is not, not like just seeing that it's a stoplight on an image or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We, we... And... And a photo of someone, you know, wearing their jumper, that's not got the resolution you need. You know, you mm. need quite up close. You need to be able to really see the stitches quite well. So, yeah. No, it's so, not like seeing. Actually, recognition, by the way, can, it does have knitting. It can recognize knitting in it, but it doesn't go any further than that. It just all right, knows so that it's knitting. It knows yeah. that it's knitting, but not yeah. more than that. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you took the, the SageMaker route, trying to then source your own data as well for this. And yes. how did that turn out? <sighs> oh, well, I put out a tweet. Um, I put, do, sh should I share my screen? I can show you the tweet yeah. that I put out with, uh, let me just pull it up here. Um, all right, get training data. All right, I will show this. So if I go uh, share, share screen. This is live, people. Yes, it's live. Go. Okay, you can see that. So that yep. is actually the, uh, that's how the MIT people did their swatches. So they actually knitted knitted these with a channel to put steel rods into to try and lay them flat for photography, right. which is a nice way of trying to solve the problem. But as you can see there, their examples. You know, they do some lace stitches and different things. And I thought that's really cool. They had thousands of them. I, I'm not gonna have thousands of them. I need to be, this to be much simpler. So I decided to crowdsource. Um, um, I set up a little email pipeline, I should mention as well. Uh, I just used Amazon's uh, simple email service. I set up an email address because I knew I wanted all these training images in an S3 bucket. And I didn't want to have to download them all to scrape them. You know, I didn't want people emailing them right to me and then I'd have to upload. I thought, let's just send them straight to the S3 bucket. So, and, I, and I think this yeah. shows that, yes, you are a developer. This is the developer <laughs> route for, for, for Yeah, of course. You know, there was some developer stuff in here. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a little Lambda that would that would take the incoming images. It would obviously check them for, you know, viruses and things like that, but then um, record them in a database and, and upload them to the S3 bucket. So I got all that ready so I could handle the, you know, huge volume of, of knitting data sample images I was expecting. Yep. Uh, and then I put out a tweet. And this was the tweet I sent out in October 2019. Uh, and I, I had a blog post as well. And I sort of said, um, hey, send me, send me your, your, you know, send me your examples. And it got retweeted like 350 times. Like it went, you know, it went viral on knitting Twitter. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And, and people started sending in images. I saw the S3 bucket started to get stuff in it and that was really exciting. And then I looked at them and um, despite putting, you know, very detailed, as I thought, instructions on what I want, yeah, people got very excited. They got very excited and, you know, I, I got quite <laughs> a wide range of images. Um, you know, some people sent me lovely pictures, of the whole garments, which are good. They're just not close up enough for me to actually get any detail from. And then some people attached the wrong images or, well, you know. Yeah. What's the top middle one? <laughs> now, the lovely lady sent me a message and she said, Chris, I think I might've attached a photo of Halloween candy. I said, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so All I right, thought. So com I comparing this to the MIT data. Yes, exactly. I thought I was saving myself effort by crowdsourcing data, and I was not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will. I will. Yeah, but and, and, you know, people were being so generous and wanting to help. And I remember I I got a few messages from Janelle Shane, who some people might know. She does the AI weirdness uh, blog and writes those interesting posts where she you know names colors or romance novels or whatever using a neural network. And so she retweeted it. And she's a knitter as well. There's such an overlap between knitters and computer people. Mm -hmm. um, and also, she's the one who actually pointed me to the MIT paper uh, among many others. So. Yeah, so 
I ended up spending a lot of time cleaning up the data. Right, and and maybe that is a point in itself, the, the importance of data yes. when it comes to machine learning. If you take nothing else away as a as a non compute non non data scientist, data scientist told me you will spend eighty percent of your time cleaning data. I did hmm. not believe them. It is true. It is one hundred percent true. That is by far the most time consuming part of the project. Right. So you then had some source data uh, cleaned up and and something that you were able to use. Yes, and then I needed to label it. So people mm. were sending these to me. I didn't want to label them all myself. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to get hands on with, with uh, SageMaker's Ground Truth. Um, and I can actually show that if you'd like to see. Uh, can I, I might have to drag it into a separate window here. And if I share that. So SageMaker is, uh, well, it's something that it contains a lot of different services. So SageMaker isn't one service, right? That's right. It has a lot of services in it. And um, Ground Truth is one of those. So tell us a bit about Ground Truth. So Ground Truth, uh, we introduced um, at reInvent, I think it was 2018. Um, but it allows you to create a, a labeling. Joy, am I getting a credential error here? Refresh. Eh, session expired. Always. Always. Okay, um, yeah. it's got it's, SageMaker is basically our end-to-end -end service for every facet of, of of machine learning, and it's for people who kind of know what they're doing. You know, we have different levels of our machine learning stack, and at the bottom, of course, is the roll your own for the for the hardcore data scientists who want to hmm. spin up their own machine image, who want to throw you know different technology at it. Um, and then we've got atop the AI services, which are sort of the pre-trained models, and you just invoke basically as an API. This is the, the stack in the middle, and there's lots of services. It's a complete end-to-end -end, uh, solution for, for build, building training data, for doing inference. It's got a lot in it. And Ground Truth is something that we released, which allows you to create uh, labeling jobs that you can use uh, custom workforces for to actually label stuff. So if I open up here, simple classification, and you can see here the results. Um, so I had these different images that people sent me, and you can see there's a label underneath. And what I can do, I actually open up the labeling tool and show you what that looks like. So you can see this, yes. So it's actually really simple and, and kind of fun to set up. So I put in the instructions here on the side. You can customize the instructions for what the people will see. And there's a few different options uh, you can do. You can have them draw boxes around shapes if you're trying to do identification of, of what's in a scene. Um, but you can see what I did is I it shows them a random image from the training data, and then they have an option they can select for the five different cases that I wanted to, to try and identify. And I also put in other because people sent me in ones that were still other. Um, and so, yeah, you, I had, I think, uh, 15 different people. You can set up a custom workforce for this, or you can use Mechanical Turk. I know some people are aware of Mechanical Turk, where you can pay people, you know, uh, to, to label your jobs for you. But Knitting's kind of a niche domain, so I figured I'd better stick with experienced knitters for the labeling yeah. jobs. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you then and labeling means that you're adding a label of what the content of that image is, and in yes. this case, it is one specific. Uh, Stitch. Stitch pattern, yes, exactly. Because yes. then what we do is we take this training data set and we carve off 80% of it and we use that to train our model and we mm. set aside 20% for testing the model afterwards to see how accurate it is. Right. Um, you, yeah. you don't want to test with one of the exact images that you trained it with? No, exactly. It should know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, you carve off uh, 20%. Usually it's 80-20, I believe, that, 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 that you carve off. Um, and yeah, and so I did a few different, I tried different training jobs, as I said, Ground Truth lets you draw boxes. So uh, a few times people would send me images that had multiple stitches. And so we, we drew boxes around things. But I think this, this way worked the simplest for my use case, which was to just label it. Um, and one thing you can do when you set up the job for Ground Truth is you can say each image has to be uh, labeled a certain number of times, and that helps you make sure that you don't have any mistakes. You know, so mm -hmm. I said each image had to review at least three times, so that so that I didn't get any errors in there.
All right. So then, what's the next step when when you have labeled these images? So your well, your source data uh, has labels. What's the next step? Then it's time to train your model. And um, so I used SageMaker for that. So I'll go back to SageMaker here. Uh, and if I go to uh, training, training jobs, what you will see is uh, and this is where you'll see I'm not a data scientist. If I go back and look from, you know, it took me uh, how many different training jobs until I got one that actually finished? I think seven or eight to get one that actually completed. And what you see here is I've actually, okay. Yep, so I just, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the eighth one actually completed. Because it's tricky. Like SageMaker is, I liken it to, you know, it, it, it's got all the bells and whistles. If you know what buttons to push, SageMaker gives you really great flexibility as a data scientist. Hmm. Me, I was working from some demos and some blog posts and trying to apply it to my use case. And so there was a bit of trial and error to get it to actually work. But I did actually get one that completed. Um, and I set up a little front end for inference and I tried it out. And the very first one was correct. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> nailed it. Uh, and, and then quickly realized it was returning stockinet stitch for everything. It was worse than a coin flip. It was terrible. <laughs> and that's the other, that's lesson number two. Your first model is always garbage. Um, mm. uh, what do we say in Australia? It's like the first pancake. The first pancake's never good. So, you know, you no. have to make many. And so that's why you see I made so many different models testing different, um, different configurations and yeah, uh, trying and just trying to get which ones had the best results. And so if I look at one of these, like this one, take 14, it completed. Um, and SageMaker gives you lots of information. It, it tells you, I was using the image classification algorithm. SageMaker has a lot of different algorithms you can choose from. I just went with image classification. Um, I used a P3 to extra large. If people are interested, you, you can specify which instance you run your training on, which makes a difference for how long it takes. Um, you give it your S, you point it to your S3 bucket that has your training data in it. I also pointed it to another bucket that had the 20% validation images. Mm -hmm. And it gives you some stats here as well. And so, yeah, you, you can get, look, I don't know what most of this means, <laughs> but I'm sure that Antia could tell us. <laughs> Yeah, but, but that's uh, kind of the point with this as well, to, to show that you can actually use it without being a data scientist, and you're able to, to actually get results from it anyway. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you absolutely can. And we have some great blog posts, and the ramp-up guides are really helpful for that. And and I did eventually get a job that, that had quite good accuracy. Um, one thing that I did that was very helpful that I didn't know about was hyperparameter tuning jobs. That yeah. sounds very fancy. Um, I have that, that is in here as well, hyperparameter tuning jobs. So this is where, I guess hyperparameters are all the little different options that you can tweak when you're, when you're training your model, hyperparameters. SageMaker has a built in the ability that it will try out hundreds of combinations for you and rank them to find the best combination. So you don't have to manually do that. So I ran one, as you can see, I, I ran a couple of them here. I ran one for 13 hours to find the best model. Um, and that was a tip I got from our colleague Gabe, and that that really helped me fine tune and get the best the best model. So, and question I, in the yeah. chat: Did you see it? <laughs> yes, and I actually have a slide where I will show you some costs later at the end. So, All right. pause on that. I do have I do have that information. Cool. So, <laughs> all right, uh, and then what? Now you you were able to. To well, actually I actually get tweaked, some results. I should mention I also tweaked my training data quite a lot over the course of all these training jobs and the hyperparameter tuning. Um, so what I did, I ended up cropping all the images to a standard size. I think mm. with image vi computer vision, that really helps. I also uh, ran them through image magic and rotated everyone 90 degrees, which also has the nice effect of doubling your training data size. So I ended up with about so, 900 images. All so up. even I also, though... Even yeah. though it is the same image, you can actually because use you've it. Because you rotated it. Yep, yeah. that works. Um, I made them all black and white to sort of, I didn't want to have any influence of color. Like the color is kind of irrelevant. So that's one trick I got. So make them all grayscale. Um, I also introduced uh, clutter, which is a, a specialized term I didn't know as a non-data scientist. This is where you add in images of things that aren't what you're looking for. Right. Um, 
you know, because when I trained my first model, I dragged in a picture of a cat and it told me that's stockinette stitch. I'm like, wait, what? It's because I trained it on only images of knitting. So to the, to the model, everything in the world is knitting. So I added in pictures of animals and airplanes and musical instruments. You can find these data sets online. And that way you train it that not everything in the world is knitting. So clutter is the term for that. And um, yeah, and then I ended up getting some quite good results. I got to, oops, let me just pull. Go back to my little slide thing because, yeah. So we talked about labeling it with ground truth. Ah, this is where I started to descope, by the way, because I realized, <laughs> for example, I had moss stitch and seed stitch. Uh, I discovered only halfway through that the Americans and the British and the Australians used them to mean different things. So right. my data, it was unreliable. I discovered that garter stitch and reverse stockinette stitch look really hard for even me to tell apart. So I threw that out. So basically I scoped it down, inspired by Silicon Valley to just stockinette or not. Yep. So that's what I went with, <laughs> stockinette or not. Um, I trained the model. We talked about that. Me, sorry, let me just skip through all of this because I've showed you this. And this is my little web front end. And as you can see, this is where the cat came up as stuck in that stitch. Mm. Oh. Terrible. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and that was my all... first, my first training job, 45% accuracy. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. So it was 41% sure that it was stuck in it, the cat. Yes. It was 41% sure that it was stuck in that stitch for the cat. Uh, <laughs> so, and yeah, so, yeah. so this is me. Yeah. So by training job 15, Using all of the tweaks I told you that I made with hyperparameter optimization, 900 images, I got it up to 94, 94.8%, um, which is pretty darn good. Um, and I was very happy with that. Um, and then I see recognition custom labels. And I'm like, what? It was literally like two weeks after I finished. We brought this out. Ah, always the way. So let's start with Amazon recognition first, about what Amazon recognition is. Have you played around with it at all? I have. Yeah. Sure. What did you use it for? Well, I, I've used it to for the basic thing to recognize objects in images. Um, that's so. It hasn't been the main focus of what I've done, but usually it's quite uh, an interesting thing to add when you're building different kind of demos to to add AI to to whatever you're building. Yeah. And recognition is definitely one of those that people enjoy to see. And it's super easy to use. It can recognize celebrities and different options, you yep. know, different objects in scenes. Uh, but until now you were limited to the objects it had been trained on. And with mm. custom labels, what we, what we brought out is the ability for you to provide your own custom training data. And it would, there's this concept of transfer learning in machine learning where you can, you know, take a pre-trained model, but apply it to your data. Uh, which is what I decided to try and do with the, I already had that great training data set after all that work that I had in an S3 bucket straight from ground truth. And I was able to feed that right into recognition custom labels. And I was interested to see whether the results would be comparable. And I will, I have that in, uh, I can open that up right now, recognition. So while you're doing that, everyone, this is the AWS Nordics office hours. If you just joined us, we're talking about machine learning for non-data scientists like Chris and myself, um, who perhaps doesn't know all the ins and outs of machine learning and, well, SageMaker, perhaps. So yeah, so Amazon recognition, custom labels. Yep, custom labels here. Uh... Um, it is so easy to use. Like I was blown away by this. You just create a project. Um, and so I created a project called knit ML. That's, that's my, the name of my little project and underneath it, each one of these is a model. So to train a new model, you literally you give it a name, you point it at a data set, or you can even upload them straight into this UI. You don't actually if I do create a new test data set and we'll call this Nordic knit ML. And I will create a new, uh, oh, I have to have a data set set up. So no, I can't do it. Um, you can actually upload. Uh, if I go to data sets here, let's do that. Create data set, Nordics ML. 
You can point it to an S3 bucket. You can use SageMaker Ground Truth as I did, or you can actually just upload images from your computer. Um, hmm. So if you do this option, it actually gives you a UI and you can actually just start. Yes, I know how to use the tool. So if I, uh, let's just add some images. I have on my computer some test images here. So let's just add five of these. So you don't actually have to go through that whole process. You can actually, and theoretically, you can actually start with as little as, I think, is it is it 10 images for custom labels? I think it's like 10. Uh, I didn't get very good results using only a few images. <laughs> right. Obviously, the more you have, the better. Um, yep. But you can upload them straight from your computer here, and then you can actually label them. So for example, I know this one here, La Mingus, I can actually, I need to add some labels. So I need to add a label, call it Stockinette. Uh, not stock in it. Like you could do this project so quickly. And so Lomingus here is actually. Uh, I don't think it added the second one, did it? I didn't add the second one. Did I not hit the button? It's probably because my not stock in it. There we go. Yeah. So Lomingus. Oh, assign labels. Here we go. It's stuck in it. So you can go through and label your, your data set very easily in this way. You don't have to have the, the hundreds of images and ground truths, but if you do so much, the better. Hmm. And then you can feed that into a project. And you literally, you don't have to. It's so easy to train a model. You, you give it uh, Nordics ML. I'll just pick an existing data set for this just to show you. Uh, you choose a training data set, you choose a test uh, a test data set, or I can you could just tell it to just split 80-20 based on the, the data set that you've given it, and you click train. That's it. Those are the only buttons you have to click <laughs> to actually kick off the training job. And I mean, of course, that means so much is abstracted away from you. I don't get to choose what instance it runs on. I don't even get to choose the algorithm. It's going to figure out the best one to use. Um, and so you, you lose a lot of the control you have that you get with SageMaker. But it's so easy to do. Yeah, it also means that you don't have to choose which instance to use. You don't have to choose uh, the different options. So. Absolutely. Makes it, makes it definitely easier to get started with. You do, the, yeah, I mean, you lose a little bit of control over, over how long it takes to train because we, that's how uh, recognition is billed by the hour for training. Mm. And so, because you don't really have control, it's a little bit nerve wracking because you're like, oh, most of the ones I did, um, if I go back and show you, I think mine all finished in, uh, can I, uh, if I click on them, you'll see most of them finished in under an hour. Um, 0.827 hours for this one. You know, I think there was one version that ran for four hours, but everything else did in, in well under an hour. And the data so, how big was it? 900? I think 900. The, where's the one that went for four hours? Was it this one? No, that one, uh, 900 images, that was 0.827. And it's interesting because when you click on one of them, you can see, you know, you can see your actual uh, test results. So it'll show you the test data that mm. I carved aside. It will show you whether it was accurate or not. Um, so this was one that was correct, true, positive. Um, this one here is, see, some of these are actually difficult for me. Look, there's some clutter. There's an accordion. It knows that the accordion <laughs> is not stuck in that stitch. Correct. And so it scores itself based on this. Um, and this one's pretty accurate, actually. So if you look at the accuracy ratings there, the one that got the worst, um, 66, I think was the very first one I, no, this was, this is the one that ran for four hours. The one that ran for four hours had the worst results. Mm. And it's where, um, I think I used the color images. It was where I used the original color images, and that performed the worst. So actually, grayscale worked better, I found. That's interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. And then to actually um, demo it, um, what we, we have this great, I, I have to show this because I think it's so cool. Um, I found on our GitHub, on the AWS Samples GitHub, we have this great recognition custom labels demo. And it spins up this lovely little website pointing to your custom labels. Um, 
that you can just launch by just clicking a CloudFormation stack. And so I've done that. And so I can actually, we can try them out and I can show you what it looks like. Can you share that link with me so I can share it in the chat as well? Yes, I will. I will share that with you right now. Go. There you go. Thank you. And so I, I've, I've spun this up. And this is the other awesome thing about custom labels. If I go back to that, you just got projects and data sets, models and data sets. With SageMaker, you have to set up an endpoint. You have to set up an endpoint configuration. All of this stuff for doing inference, you know, for actually submitting an image and getting back a prediction. You actually have to do a little bit of that scaffolding yourself. Recognition Custom Labels handles that for you. Like, that is available for inference. I don't have to host anything. I don't have to do, even with SageMaker, I had to, for example, have a Lambda as an intermediary because SageMaker endpoints are not exposed to the public by default. So recognition custom labels was just so much easier. And so here I have, uh, you know, I did five different versions, trying out different ones. Um, and I've started these a little earlier this morning because it does take a little bit of time for the model to start up for you to start using. But if I open, I think this is the one that got the best results here. And I will upload uh, some test images. I've got some test images. So I will start with that one of Lamingus we just saw. Um, confidence stuck in it, 100%. <laughs> hey, it's, it's pretty sure on that one. Yep. Um, uh, how about me? This is a jumper that I was wearing, stuck in at Stitch. Um, Paulina, it gets this one wrong. It's not perfect. Um, this is one image, uh, a woman's jumper I took a picture of. It gets wrong every time. It thinks it's stuck in it. I don't actually know what Stitch this is. I think I know why, because you can see stuck in it Stitch kind of looks like little Vs. And you can see that here, obviously. I think can, that's the feature, but I'm not sure. Can you open an, an image in, in a different window? Just hold it next to this that one. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, a stuck in that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to compare. Well, the two. I'll, uh, yes. Uh, how can I just share both? I'll switch. I'll do a stuck in that one, and you can. All right. Oh yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah. I'll go back to the. Yeah. Where was it? Too many windows open. I'll do a stuck in it one for you. Like here's just a very basic. Um, so I don't know if that's a, this is a fuzzy one actually, and it gets yeah. this one wrong because it's so fuzzy. Where's a good stuck in it one? There's a good one. You can see it's got little like columns of little yeah. V's. And so I think that's why it gets the Paulino one wrong, but it's hard to say. Um, so it's not perfect. Uh, you know, I know that there's this concept in machine learning of overfitting of where you've, you know, you, you, and so I'm, um, uh, yeah, I, obviously I need to get now maybe some, some advice from one of our machine learning colleagues on how I can, uh, test this even better, but I'm really so, pleased. And this demo is so easy to test and demo and it's yeah. so great. But may maybe more tests or um, sam sample data of, of that stitch that it doesn't get right? Yeah. Do you possibly. think that is the... And it might be, you know, 900 images is not a big data set when you no. talk to some of these machine learning. You know, I think that MIT group, they used they used like 5,000 or something. So, yeah. So I, I didn't have nearly as many uh, training images as some of those. I have your jumper, Gunnar. Yes. You, you brought one, yeah? I did. Where is it? <laughs> so Chris asked me to bring a jumper, so I brought one of their kids' jumpers. Okay. So let's see. And you've sent me a little sample image. Yeah. And it gets it wrong. Um, so it thinks this is stuck. And it's very, see, but this doesn't have the little Vs. So mm. I wonder if it's because it's a very regular pattern. Uh, yeah, it's getting this one wrong. So this is actually reverse stockinette stitch. This is the backside of stockinette stitch. Um, and it's something where if I had more, I need a bigger training data set that has the different types of stitches. Um, so I did, I did do two different models here. So the one here, let's test it on this one. Uh, so this model actually tries to identify which stitch it is, not just stockinette or not. Yeah. That still gets it wrong as well. Obviously, you need more need more samples of that particular stitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And you can see it's really cool. You can see the request that's being sent. You can see the response that's. And obviously, you know, one of the things you get, and I think developers need to understand about machine learning, is you don't get a yes/no answer. You get a confidence spectrum. Mm. 
you know, and we have to know how to how to interpret that. That's one of the things I, I talk to developers about is regardless of whether you think you want to implement machine learning models, you know, in the future, the APIs you're interacting with are sometimes not going to return a binary answer. And you're going to have to branch your logic depending on the results that you get back. Uh, so it's important to know a little bit about how this stuff works, even if you don't have a particular machine learning case you want to utilize. I, mean, I think that's a really great point that in in this case, if I were to build an application using this this uh, model, I need to decide is is ninety seven point eight percent confidence in something good enough to have a binary answer to that in my code, a yes or a no. I can't right. resist testing the cat. <laughs> the cat is definitely not knitting, so that's uh, you know. But yes, you're absolutely right. You need to decide the threshold for the project, and obviously, this is a silly example. This is determining knitting stitches. This is not determining whether or not someone gets approved for a bank loan. You know, mm. so there's obviously depending on the project, uh, you really need to know what those thresholds should be um, and look at them very closely. And well, you just said that it's a, a silly example, but think about this but apply to other areas. What, what kind of examples could you see based on, on the same principles? Well, I can give you a really good example, actually. So one of our AWS heroes who is in Italy, uh, his name is Luca Bianchi. Um, Luca wrote a blog post because he did kind of the exact same thing I did. He had a model that he did in SageMaker, and then he fed it into recognition custom labels to, to uh, compare. And so this is the blog post, and I'll put it to you in chat as well so you can share it. Um, but the use case here is, I think, if people want to know what is a practical use case for this. This is using recognition or using image recognition um, to automate detection for heating and air conditioning. You know, you want to know if it's dirty, like for, mm. for maintenance purposes and stuff like that. And so uh, in this in this blog post, you can read through it. Um, Luca did the same thing as I did, did it with SageMaker and went through all the process of getting training data and all of that and got, you know, pretty good results and then tried it with custom labels and found out that it gave comparable results with so much less effort. Um, and I can actually show you in terms of my own results, if I change what I'm sharing here, go back to where I have my results, because that was the thing that blew my mind. So I had 900 images, I got like 98%, you know, uh, and obviously there are those edge cases, as we said, where it gets wrong, uh, but based on my training data, recognition custom labels, it's hard, the, the, the results it gives you here are not one-to-one -one with the results SageMaker gives you, but it's, it's comparable, like in my testing, it's comparably accurate. And Luca arrived yeah. at the same conclusion for the HVAC example. Oh, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and also just looking at comparing the two, of course, as you mentioned several times with SageMaker, you have more control over how to train your models, uh, what to do with it, how to improve on that data. Uh, but, but the speed that you can have a trained model with recognition custom labels, it's, it's, yeah, it's hard to compete with. I actually think the next slide, if I bring it up, hang on, oh no, hang on, let me just, this is the one that compares the two. Right. So I kind of tried to do a little comparison. So, you know, training time was ultimately with SageMaker faster, but that's because you have control over what size mm -hmm. instance you throw at it, you know? Um, cost is the big one where it makes a huge difference because recognition custom labels, this is the important thing for anyone who's doing it. Um, for every hour that you have that model turned on for inference, you're paying four bucks an hour. So really recognition custom labels works great for a use case like Luca's where you batch up all the images, you turn on the inference, you run it across your batch and then you shut it down again. So you would not use recognition custom labels for anything where you wanted to keep it ongoing, like you know, for a, a, a web app or something where you want it on 24 seven, don't right. do that. Batch it up and run it through it. So and could you go the there? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I was going to say cost is there as well. Um, and really, it's it's that it's that you the recognition cost is very simple: a dollar an hour for training and four bucks an hour for inference. It it makes it super simple. Versus you know SageMaker, you've got a lot more variables. But I think I spent about fifty bucks on the training for SageMaker. And that includes, you know, I ran 13 hours of hyperparameter optimization hmm. training. You might not need to do that. Um, but that, yeah, you, it, 
we, we calculate them differently. There's a question in the chat about uh, Jupyter and AWS guides or tutorials, and, and there are a bunch of, of... I mean, Jupyter Notebooks, I didn't go that route just because I'm, you know, that's... Uh, I've seen examples, and I did a couple internal tutorials at AWS using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, my Python is probably a bit rusty these days, so I decided... I, I did all of this in the console because I wanted that experience of going through it sort of in the most layperson way possible. But yes, we, we absolutely have blog posts that can get you. And SageMaker now has, like, the quick starts and things. Uh, that's my other thing I would like to try out and because, uh, you know, SageMaker now have, have some patterns that you can get started maybe a bit faster than it did when I was using it two years ago. I posted a link to the documentation about using uh, notebooks. Um, mm. So maybe that's a good place to start, at least, to learn more about yeah. that. If, if I ever do this Muslim notebook, I will share it. But for now, it's all just been done in the, in the console, really. But what if you start out with recognition custom labels, and then you want to have more control? Well, it, once you have that training data, you can absolutely feed that in SageMaker. You know, you can reuse it. So custom labels was getting the training data is the hard part. You're not hmm. going to, you know, custom labels only saved me the headache on the training, the actual training and inference part. In terms of getting a clean data set, we have not yet come up with the magic bullet on that. You know, ground truth is helpful, but you've still got to, you've still got to do the hard work yourself there. Right. So... <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and, and that last line there, ease of use, is really where it came down to for me. That um, you know, I those five models I did in recognition custom labels. I think I did that in about two hours on a Sunday morning. You know, it was just so simple to do. Yeah, that's really interesting um, for sure. So there was a question earlier on about uh, any architecture links to share. Do you have? Anything to share in regards to what you've what you've created? So uh, I have a repo? yeah, I have a longer version of this talk that I goes into more detail on some of this stuff, and so I can uh, share that with you. I don't have it available on a GitHub repo. I have some blog posts on my site, but like for example, the SES architecture, I've not documented, and I need to do that. So that is a good call out, and I will do that. I mean, most of this as I said, was done in the console, so there's not a lot to actually share, but I should document it all in a really in-depth blog post so people can recreate it. Yeah, for sure. Can, can you perhaps share a link to the blog post at least so we can get that in the chat? Let me see, yes. You talk, I'll find it. Yeah, yeah that's fine. <laughs> uh, so I, I know also you had there's a great link on the machine learning ramp up guide. Let me post yes. that as well. So useful. Which is something from AWS training and certification. A question in the chat, why not use the knitting training book images? Are oh, to get yes. So there are a lot of, I guess, like a stitch guide. Is that what you mean, Shri, there? Um, that's an option. So there, there are various books people have published, which are just like, you know, ha have basically a little image like All I right. had and have them labeled. Part of it was just because uh, the legal rights for doing that, you know, I didn't want to be scanning someone else's book. Um, so especially because I knew I wanted to talk about this in a few places and I, I wanted to make sure that I had the rights to use the data and the easiest way to do that was to get my own. Um, but yeah, that would be an option. Um, but really, really that book only has one picture for each stitch pattern. And what you want is you want to have multiple so that you can mm. train it. Um, so yeah, that, that at least is a starting point. You could use that as a starting point, but it's not got um, everything. I'm going to put in here a link. So that is the full talk. You know, we, I showed you a few of the slides, but if you want to see in detail, that's probably the best place to send you. If you go to that talk there um, that I've just shared, Gunnar, that was a recent conference I did back in Australia uh, that that I went through the whole project in detail. But I will, I will. If people follow me on Twitter, I will write a blog post and share it on there. All right. Cool. So. I'm interested to see a bit more on SageMaker and on Ground Truth. So are we able to skip yeah. back there? You want me to go back to Ground Truth? Yes, please. All right. 
you you've got an idea for something to do with it? No, no. <laughs> well, I I want to see uh, if you're able to just show from the well how you get started with the ground truth. Absolutely, yeah. So. Okay, go back there we here go. to back. SageMaker. So ground truth. So what you set up is you set up a labeling job. And so if I go to create a labeling job, I'm going to give it a name, Nordics ML. Um, you can uh, give it the S3 location, your S3 bucket where you've got uh, – see, they've changed this since I've done it. So I'm like, I'll have to look at the UI a little close. Um Manual data setup. Yeah, so this is where I can actually point it to my S3 bucket. Mm. Uh, and then you give it a task type. And as you can see, there are a few different types. This is where I told you, like, I explored with we're drawing bounding boxes. Um, you can do image classification with multi-label, single label, and you can even get them to draw really closely around different images if you're trying to, you know, identify people versus cars or whatever. Um, so it... My knitting skills are well; they are below basic. So, can it? Can, well, can it? Does the jumper have multiple stitches in the same? Yes. So Is the jumper common? you showed me on the front has multiple oh, yeah. stitch patterns. Yes. So if you, yeah, that one has multiple patterns on the right. front. Um, hold it right up to the um, camera. I think uh, there, there you go. go. There you can see it. Yeah, that's got multiple stitch patterns on it. So would that be next level stuff uh, then to be able to recognize multiple stitches in the That sense? is the next one, definitely. So that's where I was trying to do bounding boxes so that people right. could draw a box around this bit is garter stitch, this bit is stuck in that stitch. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I need to just go back to my data set and make sure it's really clean and, and in order to get that to work. So that, that is another future iteration is to go back and try and mul identify multiple in the same garment. All right, so you then choose which type of job you want to do. Yep. And, and you feed, yeah. Make, yeah, yeah. So you give it, can I give it a bucket? Let's just give it a bucket. Let's give it a raw, sure, whatever. It's been a while. Well, anyway, we'll just, yeah. You, yeah. you, you give it a bucket, you give it this, and it will then set up. It's not going to do it because I haven't given it the bucket. Um, I'll go into an existing labeling job. As I said, there is a way you can put in some custom instructions um, for your actual, uh, for the specific domain you're doing. So, you know, mm. if you're identifying different birds and you want people to draw a box around it or whatever, you can actually put that in there. And so that's where if I go and view labeling tool, um, that was that bit on the left I did where I put in the instructions. Right. So you can provide some custom. It's a little bit of HTML, basically, you can specify for doing there. And you can also specify, that's a good point, so the workforce experience, so um, labeling workforces. So you can set up your job to use Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, you can have a private workforce, or you can actually even have a vendor be your workforce for you. I set up a private one. And so whenever it sets up like the necessary uh, cognito identities and all of that. And so whenever someone volunteered that they would do it, I would set them up in there and it would actually um, send them an email with a login and a UI to actually. So it's very nice from their point of view. They it, It's just a little web app they go to and they get logged in and it tells them you have 50 images to review and they mm. click through and do it. And that's that's the dirty secret of machine learning is ultimately there are a lot of human beings clicking a lot of buttons to make it possible. <laughs> there are. And you and I spoke before this session that none of us, uh, uh, we haven't used Mechanical Turk. So it would be interesting no. to know if any of the viewers have tested Mechanical Turk and what's your opinion on that then? I mean, I think mm. if you were like drawing boxes around a basketball or something, sure, you know, people know mm. that. But I didn't want to rely on, on, you know, if I was finding it tricky to identify the different stitches, I, I knew that a, a random workforce would not be able to do it. No, probably not. Yeah. Cool. So with, uh, who did you use for, for workforce, by the way? Did you use so just people you knew? Yeah, I had about 15 knitters. Um, <laughs> I actually have, you know, I should do, I should show you my my thank you screen because, you know, that's, that's. Uh, I, I love to give credits to these folks who helped me out on, on doing this. Um, uh, 
So yeah, I had, yeah, there's, you get some stats on your ground truth job. So that those mm. stats there actually come from ground truth. So you can see it took about 17 seconds per, per labeling job. Um, and because I did different versions of the bounding boxes and the labeling, about 3000 different, you know, labels got clicked. Uh, so that's, that's quite a lot. Um, and 14 and a half hours. And so I've got here some of the people who I think had about 15 people who labeled and about 50 people who sent in images. So it was quite a big team in the end. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Gabe at the bottom as well. Yeah. Well, Gabe, cool. Gabe helped me out with some code for, um, a little web app for doing the SageMaker inference. I didn't get a chance to show that off, but if people watch the full version of the talk, they can see that a little react app for doing, it doesn't, you know, I couldn't find a nice version like the react recognition custom labels one, but I, I built a little react app based on what Gabe gave me for that. Is that similar to his, uh, bird recognition? I haven't seen it. Does he do bird recognition? It's probably yeah. the same. It's probably the yeah, same. He had it on be. GitHub and shared. I think it's gone now, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it is very useful. All right. Well, very cool. So we're approaching top of the hour, so getting time to wrap up. But if you have any final questions for Chris, uh, hurry up and post them in the questions chat. have been great. I was so worried no one would ask anything. <laughs> no, there's been some really good questions. Yeah. throughout the episode. All right, so Chris, let's try to summarize this then. Uh, if you were to start from the beginning, how would you do this now with everything you know? Hindsight. Hindsight. Uh, well, always, I think if you're trying to learn a new area of technology, find a real problem to solve. I think that's the most important part. And especially with data science, you know, you get a lot of demos and things where you download some sample data. It doesn't mean anything to you. I would have never been motivated to see this project through to completion if I wasn't really kind of interested and curious about the results. So start with a problem you really want to solve. Hmm. See if there are an existing data sets. And you know, Kaggle.com is a great place to find data sets. Um, it's very interesting that we're working, I'm working on a, a talk for reInvent right now, which is related to this, uh, which may involve different types of beer. <laughs> and so we've been looking at data sets for that and maybe trying to source our own. Um, but try and find a good data set and then just know that you will spend a lot of time getting clean data. Keep in mind what I said if you're doing image recognition. Do the rotation trick, add in some clutter, make them grayscale. All of that is going to give you much better results in the end. And don't be afraid to de-scope. Start with a really simple pro you know, problem. Is it one thing or another? And then you can build on more complexity on top of that. But recognition custom labels, definitely. Uh, yep. I, if, if that had existed, I probably wouldn't have even gone the SageMaker route back then. But having looked at SageMaker and gone through that process, I think you've probably learned a lot that you are then able to apply. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And things like hyperparameter optimization, like I now have hands on experience of what, what does that mean? And what, a mm. you know, and things like how, how do you know that a model is accurate? It's not just yes or no, that's correct. You know, did it get it right that it was the label? Did it get it right that it was not the label? That whole like true positive, false positive, like there's a lot of nuance that goes into that, that I wouldn't have really known about from just reading a blog post. All right, very cool. So this has been another episode of AWS Nordic's Office Hours. This week, I was joined by Chris Howard, and we were talking about machine learning for non-data scientists and knitters. And knitters. Well, thank you yeah. so much for having me. It's been really fun. Well, thanks for joining us, Chris. And I hope everyone watching enjoyed it. Uh, and we will, of course, be back next week. And uh, next week, uh, we will be talking about CDK pipelines for oh, exciting. Well, for for everyone, <laughs> not only for non-data scientists and knitters. not just for knitters. No, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, thanks everyone for watching. My name is Gunnar Grosh. I was joined by Chris. Say hi, Chris. Guten Tag. And... <laughs> All right. Bye, bye, everyone. See ya.